word says that while we were yet sinners, yes, that Jesus died on the cross. So we thank you, Almighty God, for sending your son in spite of who we are, the things that we have done, the hiccups, the mistakes, oh God, that you loved us anyway and you continue to love us and to show us your mercy and we bless your holy and righteous name this morning for everything that you have done. Just as the psalmist said, if you never do anything else, oh God, you've already done enough and we thank you this morning. We begin to lift up situations, almighty God, the people who are oppressed and depressed, the people who may be ill, oh God, mentally, physically, whatever it may be, we know you as a healer, we know you as a comforter, we know you as a friend that sticks closer than any brother, and we ask, Lord, that you would minister to them this morning, that you would begin to put laborers in their path that would encourage and uplift, and not just make their spiritual needs, oh God, but their natural need, oh God, that it would also be met. Begin to pour out your Holy Spirit, oh God, in this hurting and sick nation, in this hurting world, oh God. Pour out your healing balm, for we know, oh God, that all it requires is one touch from you and that we will be forever changed. So we ask, oh God, that you would allow your healing balm to infiltrate this city, oh God, and then move out through the state and the nation and the entire world. We thank you, Father, for setting us free. Now give us, Father, the opportunity, Father, the desire to help liberate, liberate others, to encourage them, to minister about your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the things that you have done for us, how you have called us out of darkness into light, how you have lifted us, O oh God, from situations, allow our lives to be living testimonies for those, Father, who don't yet know you, who don't yet know you as Lord and Savior of their lives. We thank you, Father. Now, Lord, we rebuke and bind every foul spirit that attempts to rise up. And we thank you, Father, that as the sovereign and holy God, that nothing can stand against you, that you are the true King of kings and Lord of lords, and that every single thing must kneel and bow unto you, Father, regardless of what it may be, that it must kneel at the name of Jesus, that it must proclaim, O oh God, that he is the one true God. And we ask, Father, that anything that is not like you, that it be rebuked, that it be bound, that it be set together in dry places, and that we are free, O oh God, to walk in the liberty that you have provided us, the truth that you have equipped us with. And then we go out and we teach others, O oh God, so that they too are set free. We thank you, Almighty God, for your liberation. We thank you for loving us and for calling us your children, O oh God. We thank you, Father. Now, Lord, we pray intentionally for those who are in positions of leadership and power, Father. Legislators, oh God. Representatives, senators, oh God. Governors, even the president, Father. We lift them up before you. And we thank you, Father, that their heart is in your hand. And your word declares that you turn it whichever way you choose. But we ask, oh God, that you would draw them by your spirit, draw them to you, Father. Yes. Your word says that we ought to pray for those who have rule over us. Yes. And we intentionally pray for them this morning, asking, oh God, that you would soften hearts, that you would rebuke and bind greed, oh God. And that they would clearly hear your voice in making decisions, We ask, Father, that it would be so, that you would not leave them alone, but that you would continue to draw them, Father. Tear down every work of darkness, every prayer of witchcraft, oh God. We ask, Lord, that you would 
rebuke it for your name's sake and that you would raise up people in leadership and in power, Father, who are seeking after you, who will stand against the crowd, O oh God, and do what is right for you, O oh God, because that they would rather obey you than obey man. We ask that it be done in the almighty name of Jesus. Now as service begins to proceed, Father, we ask that you would, that your presence would consume every single household that is represented. Father, that you would begin to minister to them, that you would break up fallow grounds in our hearts, Father, so that the word is planted in on good ground, oh God, that it reaps a bountiful harvest in due season, Father. Every single household, Father, from the parents to the children, if there's grandchildren, nieces, nephews, oh God, even parents, the parents, Father, we know that they are tasked with a great labor, but we thank you that you give them strength that you continue to lift them up and that the victory is theirs, oh God, because their trust and their hope doesn't rely on their own ability, but in you, oh God. Yes, we thank you, Father. We ask that you have your way in our lives, Father, in our homes, in our communities, oh God, have your way. It's in the almighty name of Jesus we pray and ask it to be so. Bless God. Bless God. I need the old. I need the
We'll move to um, down to verse 35 and read through 43. So Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. And it reads, When Jesus had again crossed over the boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. Now jump to verse 35. And it reads, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told, them, told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion commotion and wailing. The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Tylutha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Bless God. Bless God. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to serve. I thank you, Father, for uh, the word that you have given me. But I ask, oh God, that you would, um, even in, the, in spite of me studying and preparing, oh God, that you would speak, that your Holy Spirit would come forth, Father, and speak a word that will minister, that would heal, that would uplift, oh God, that would be what it needs to be for your people. Um, I intentionally decrease and ask that you increase in me. It's in the almighty name of Jesus we pray. Bless God. If you're standing, you may be seated. As I begin to discuss with you, she got up. She got up. Well, that's going to be the title uh, for today. She got up. Um, the month of May, it's Mental Health Awareness Month. Many mm -hmm. of us know that. Some don't. But mental health is um, a serious thing. Uh, a lot of times it's not taken seriously in the black community because we have we have wrongfully said just put it under the blood and while it's right it's also wrong so i heard a quote that said um, that prayer is a weapon but therapy is a strategy so we want to make sure that we're equipped but that we also have a strategic plan about how we move forward so mental health awareness this month, fitting for a topic she got up. Mm -hmm. You can get up from anything, but you have to know how to get up, and it requires strategy. So this passage today comes from one of the synoptic gospels, excuse me, tongue twister, synoptic gospels. And a synoptic gospel is basically that they all kind of say the same thing. So we know that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That they all say the same thing. It is just um, a different version. But the Gospel of Mark, um, I found in my studies, is different because it is a shorter gospel. It's only 16 short uh, chapters. And that Mark had two names. He had his Jewish name and his Roman name. So he's often called John Mark. If you look at like Acts 12.12, 12, 
when Peter um, had been arrested and imprisoned and the angel woke him up and brought him um, to the house of Mary, the mother, it says the Mary of John, the Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. So Mark was uh, very close to Peter. Uh, historians will say he was Peter's secretary. But we know that he is also one that was with Jesus. Praise God. So he had an insight that was a little different. He was also known as an evangelist. So his view is going to be different because he's going to see it as an opportunity to witness, right? That's going to be his perspective on things. So um, the scripture text, I always like to give the background because you need to know who's talking, right? The scripture text comes from Mark, um, and interesting enough, Jesus has just, prior to uh, this synagogue leader coming to Jesus and asking for his help, Jesus had just cast out, if you read further up in the chapter, he had just cast out the demons, the many demons from the man, and when he asked him his name, he said, I'm legion, for we are many. And in the midst of the synagogue leader coming to him, the woman with the issue of blood presents herself. So all these things are happening mm -hmm. as the synagogue leader is making his way to Jesus. I heard a quote, a quote that says, um, it doesn't matter if you fall down, it's whether you get back up. Mm -hmm. So let me tell you a little bit about the person that made that quote. He's a world-renowned athlete, I'll say that, um, and probably widely considered one of the greatest basketball players of all times. Um, he's known for his all-around ability to score, to pass, and to play as a defensive player. He has won six NBA championships with the Chicago Bulls and won NBA Finals MP each time. When I was in high school, everyone knew who Michael Jordan was. Everyone had Chicago Bulls attire. I don't care if it was a t-shirt or a key ring or a starter jacket or the Jordan shoes. We knew who Michael Jordan was. But he said, it doesn't matter if you fall down. It's whether or not you get back up. And you would wonder how someone who has had all these accomplishments will say that. So I'll just give you a little history about him because I don't know much about him. But what I found is that this same man also stated in an interview that he had missed more than 9,000 shots in his career, that he had lost almost 300 games, and that he had failed 26 times to take the game one in shot. Imagine passing the ball to Michael Jordan and he misses the game one in shot. But he said, it doesn't matter if you fall down, it's whether you get back up. With those stats in mind, those somewhat defeating stats, I understand how this monumental athlete can say that. He has to be encouraged and encourage himself and his teammates to keep moving past opposition, regardless of what it looks like, even if it pains you, regardless of what people say, because believe me, people are going to input, especially when you fail, especially when they're depending on you to make some type of difference so that they come out on the side of victory, they're gonna have something to say. But he said, doesn't matter if you fall. What matters is if you get back up. So what does it require to get up? Um, I researched and found that there are chief muscles that are used when we sit and stand. So to move from a sitting position to a standing position, we are primarily going to use our leg and our hip muscles. But we also are going to use our abdominal muscles. We have to use core muscles. If anyone has had a back injury, they know that when you go from sitting to standing, it's not an easy, easy task. It may require assistance, but it is going to require effort. Mm -hmm. 
So from sitting to standing. But now think about from lying down to standing. You're talking about maybe 50% more effort. Because now you don't just have to bring your lower body or your upper body to a standing position. You have to bring your entire body to a standing position. And it requires intentional effort. Years ago, um, maybe even a decade ago, I had to have surgery. And it required four incisions to my abdomen. And with those incisions, I had issues for at least two weeks with how I was able to get up. For the most part, someone had to wrap their arms around me, and I wrap my arms around them, we embrace, and then they pull me up or pull me close enough to the edge where I could push off. But my stomach was so weak and in pain from all of the incisions that I was not able to go to a standing position. And a lot of times, because we don't see traumas and pain that happen because we're bringing it all back. This is Mental Health Awareness Month. We don't see those pains that happen mentally, spiritually, emotionally, that we're still just trying to stand up from those things without support and without assistance. And then we cause greater injury or prolonged healing because we didn't take the necessary precautions. We didn't reach out and seek the necessary help or it wasn't offered. Maybe we sought out for it, but it wasn't offered. And so now we have this prolonged recovery. So in understanding the difficulties and the trauma associated with physical injuries, let's normalize today the difficulties and the trauma that's associated with those injuries of the heart. Those things that we can't easily go get some triple antibiotic ointment and a band-aid or gauze and try to heal or nurture back to health naturally. But those things that are so deep, that cut deep, that hurt, that make us no longer want to try, let's normalize assisting people with those traumas as well. Just as we would if we saw a baby or some small person, because we, we usually choose to have a lot of empathy on them, if we saw them fall and hurt themselves and they're bleeding, we're going to do everything we can to clean that up and nurture it back to health. Let's have that same response when there is an emotional type of trauma. Mm -hmm. That we want to be responsible for nurturing that trauma back to health. Because injuries are generally overlooked if there is no physical manifestation of them. But I want to encourage you to look with your spiritual eyes. There's physical, man there's spiritual manifestations all around. But we have to be in tune. Bless God. So in seemingly dead situations, when we don't mention the things that are painful to us, we have to have a desire to discuss them. We have to have a strategy on how to get up from them, how to work our way out of that valley to that mountaintop. And in the text, there's this man. He is a synagogue leader. So let me tell you about the synagogue leaders. The synagogue leaders looked like the Pharisees. They were equipped. They knew the law. They were taught in the things that their fathers had studied. Because all of these people came out of 12 tribes, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that they knew the law. However, they were waiting for the resurrection. And just like our sovereign and awesome God is, he said, you're waiting for the resurrection, but the resurrection is here and you don't even recognize it and it's standing in your face. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like about this scripture text because when he showed up, to the synagogue leaders. See, the Pharisees didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't believe Jesus was who he said he was. 
They believed he was a man, maybe a great prophet, but that he was not the son of God. And many times they called him out and said, you know, you're blaspheming and he needs to be stoned because he is declaring that he is the son of God. So they knew the traditions. They knew the law. But they didn't recognize that the word was right there in front of them. That the resurrection that they were waiting on had appeared. But this man, this person who had, he had resources. He had prestige. He had authority. He had servants. Because later in the text, it says that his servants came to him, right? To tell him that his daughter had died. And to leave the leader alone because she's already dead. So he stepped out of his comfort zone. He stepped away what he, from what he knew and said, I'm desperate because something I love is about to die. Something that is a part of me, attached to me, I'm about to lose it. So I'm willing to do anything. Even step away from what I believe to be normal. I'm willing to set that aside because I'm desperate. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that being a ruler, he had already exhausted everything within his power. That he didn't just go to Jesus first. That he said, well, let me see. I have access to the best positions. I have access to all this knowledge. I even have access to the priests because he was a synagogue ruler. So I have access. I'll have them come in and do everything they can for my daughter. But it wasn't enough. Oftentimes we do everything we can in our own power and we exhaust resources. But then we get upset with God because what we tried to do in our own might didn't work when we could have just went to him initially. So this ruler, Jairus, he forsakes his beliefs and his traditions and he seeks help from a man named Jesus. And he goes to him after... Well, in the midst of a large crowd, because we already established that Jesus had just rebuked uh, the many demons that were in this one man, the mm -hmm. demons that called themselves the legion because they were many. So he, the leader makes his way to Jesus and he pleads with him. He doesn't just ask. He, the word of God says that he pleads with him. I want to state it exactly. It says he fell to his feet and he earnestly pleaded with him. So with all sincerity, he's crying out and he's saying, help me. Come with me. Come to my house. My daughter is about to die. And I imagine that some people knew who he was, but Jesus, of course, knew who he was and knew what he believed, but saw his sincerity and his desperation. So he went with him. And then in a process, Jesus gets stopped. The woman with the issue of blood stops him. And that transpires. And then the man hears, you're too late. She died. Your daughter is dead. Leave the leader alone. Your daughter is dead. Yet and still, he wants Jesus to come. That's amazing faith to say, my situation is dead. But I'm still going to take it to Jesus. That it's painful, but I'm still going to take it to Jesus. That all odds are against me, but I'm still going to take it to Jesus. We have to be resilient like that. We can't just say, well, it happened, it's done, it's final. We have to remember that we serve a sovereign God and that it's not over until he says. That regardless of what it is, we can still take it to his feet. And we can say, you have your way with it. If it needs to be resurrected, I believe that you are the resurrection. And that all you have to do is say it's so. And life will begin again. So in our inadequacies, I want to encourage you today 
not to put that on God. That he is not man. He's not going to lie. And that whatever he has declared, it will be so. But we have to press our way. Even if he's busy, he's never too busy. But if we believe he's busy doing other things and our situation is insignificant, even if we have that attitude, even if our situation gets interrupted, something else happens, the woman with the issue of blood, even if someone says, it's dead, it's done, Leave him alone. Don't ask God about this anymore. It's dead. It's done. Keep pressing your way. Yes. Keep pressing yes. until he shows up. Bless God. So how do we get up? Because that's our title today. She got up. How do we get up? I want to give you four quick points on how to get up. The first one is we got to step out of our comfort zone. We have to step out of the things that we consider normal. We have to humble ourselves because this man wasn't any old man. Jairus was a ruler. He was a synagogue ruler. That means he had the reason that that stated his title was given because it's the word of God is making it clear that he had authority, that he had prestige, that he had some sort of power. So we have to humble ourselves. He didn't go to Jesus and say, hey, since you're supposed to be this person and have this power, come do this. The word of God says he fell at his feet and he pleaded with him. So we have to humble ourselves and we have to step out of our comfort zone. A lot of times we are taught things because it's a, it seems like the right thing, but it's not always a God thing. So we have to step out of our comfort zone. This synagogue leader, he knew what the law said, but he stepped away from that. We have to step away from some things that we have been taught. My, one of my favorite scriptures is, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit by the spirit. So whatever the spirit is, if it is um, an emotion, if it is a circumstance, whatever it is that has you feeling some kind of way, try it by the spirit, the Holy Spirit. That's right. And once you try it by the spirit, it will tell you, proceed or recalibrate. You know, we need to fix some things. But one is, Step out of your comfort zone and humble yourself. Those are two things that we're going to do simultaneously. We're going to step away from what we know, try the spirit by the spirit, and we're going to humble ourselves. We're going to, just as this ruler did, fall at the feet of Jesus, come to him as a child with innocence and sincerity, and ask him to look at our situation. The other thing we're going to do, step two, is believe. He said to them when they told him that his daughter was dead, don't be afraid, just believe. That's verse 36. Don't be afraid, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. So whenever fear comes, we know it's not from God. So don't be afraid. But believe, trust in what he has said. You came to me with an issue. That was an exhibition of your faith because you came to me. You wouldn't have come to me if you didn't think I could fix it. You don't go to people and ask people to do things that you know they can't do. Like I'm not going to go to my child and ask my child for a million dollars because I know it's not in their ability, not yet, to do. So I'm going to, if I need uh, a monetary loan, I'm going to a bank. I'm going to a place. I'm going to ask a place that has an ability. And this leader, he went to who he knew had the ability to resurrect his daughter. That was already his faith on display or to heal his daughter because she wasn't dead yet. So we have to believe. Stand firm in your belief regardless of the report that comes in the midst of you already took it to Jesus, keep it there. And don't sweat. Stand firm on your belief. 
And we know that our belief, our faith is restored and built up when we hear the word of God. The word, of, the word says faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So make sure you're being built up in your faith. The third thing we are going to do is remove the naysayers. There's a reason why friends fall away as we begin to grow in Christ. Because it becomes a reflection. You become a walking mirror. And a lot of times they don't like what they see. So they are going to criticize. They may condemn. They may say, I remember when. All these people began to laugh when Jesus said that she wasn't dead. She was just asleep. And he had to put them out. The word says that he took the mother, the father, and the disciples that were with him in because they were on one accord. They all wanted the same thing. They all believed the same way. The disciples believed in the ability that Jesus had to resurrect or to heal this girl. And the mother and the father desperately wanted it. So we have to align ourselves with people who are seeking God the way we're seeking God, who desperately want the things of God the way we want the things of God. Because when trouble comes, that's where your help is going to kick in. Mm -hmm. They're going to be the ones that are going to come in that room with you when there's time to, when there is a need for a miracle or resurrection to occur. So we have to remove the naysayers. We also know that Jesus removed naysayers when he um, healed the blind man in Bethesda. He brought him out of the city. There's a reason he brought him out of that city to heal him. Not that Jesus couldn't heal him right there in that city, that he couldn't heal the entire city, but would the man have received the healing? Because it's one thing for God to heal you, but it's another thing for you to receive your healing. It's one thing for God to deliver you, but it's another thing for you to receive the deliverance and walk in it. So I encourage you to remove naysayers, those people who do not believe the way you believe. And it hurts because oftentimes those are the closest people to you. But you have to remove them and set them aside. Not that you can't love them, but there are certain things I can't share with you. I got to keep this to myself because it's precious to me. Because I want to see it grow. I want to see it blossom. And I don't want the hindrance of your lack of faith, of your unbelief. So we remove naysayers, things that cause doubt and unbelief. And then the last thing we do is we have our spirit renewed. Uh, verse 43. Uh, let me give you, I'll go back and give you all the verses for these steps. But 43b, it says to give the girl something to eat. He told them to not tell anyone about this and to give her something to eat. That's her natural substance, right? But I believe also spiritually too. So she needed natural food to recover from her death and then spiritual food to recover from her death. So we want to make sure that we're being renewed, that our strength is being renewed. And we do that by getting in the word. The word of God, uh, the Lord's prayer says, give us this day our daily bread. That's not just something that we eat, that we obtain physically. That is something that we need to keep going. The word of God, the bread of life. So we want to make sure that our strength is renewed. I want to say this. One thing about blessings is that they don't have to be announced. When the anointing of God is on you, the favor of the Lord is on you, you don't have to announce it. He says in here, the word of God says he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this. And we know because his time had not yet come and that if people started spreading the word that they were going to try to crucify him before his time, right? So we know that that is one reason. But I believe the other reason is I don't need an announcement. Mm -hmm. 
Your blessing doesn't need an announcement. You don't have to put it on social media. You don't have to shout it from the rooftops. People can visibly see when the hand of God is on your life because you move different. You respond different. I'm able to get up from dead situations because the resurrector has appeared in my life. So it doesn't need an announcement. We just have to keep going. Mm -hmm. Praise God. So let's go back through the steps so I can give you the exact scripture. Step one, step out of your comfort zone and humble yourself. That's scripture or verse 23, chapter 5. Two is believe. That's verse 36. Um, three is remove naysayers, verse 40. And then the last one, uh, renew your strength. That's verse 43. And we want to make sure again that we're doing that both naturally and spiritually. Because our sovereign God can show up in any situation, even the dead situations. That's what this scripture text says to me. That this isn't just a natural death. We're not just talking about someone who transpired in life or expired in life. We're not talking about that. Someone who transitioned. We're not talking about that. We are talking about a situation, a painful situation that we may have let go of. A dream that may have died. But God is saying... Put aside everything in your ability to do and just come to me. Come to me, humble yourself, step out of your comfort zone, out of your knowledge, lay this issue at my feet. Earnestly lay this issue at my feet. Believe, remove naysayers, and then renew, be renewed in your strength. So mental health month, I pray that you understand that all you have to do is take it to Jesus. But you have to take it with a strategy. And then you have to have a plan to progressively move forward. And we can do that together. But it requires assistance most times. Just like when I had my surgery and for about two weeks I needed assistance. Let's be accountable and be assisting towards others because we want it for us. We want all the empathy when we're going through things. But let's be empathetic when others are going through things. So in closing, my question to you is, when? When will you take your issue to Jesus? Are you going to wait? Until it's at the point of death, you're going to wait till you exhaust your resources? Or are you going to gladly take it to him first? As soon as it arises, the good thing is, either way, if you take it to him first, or you take it to him even after, take it to him even after it's dead, that he can resurrect it. Bless God. So we pray that something was said today that um, will encourage you to get up. You can get up from any situation. It just requires a desire to do so and a strategic plan. Bless God. Do you want to close? So um, we never want to assume that everyone has a relationship with Christ and we never want to close without extending uh, the opportunity for uh, anyone to give their life to Christ. Um, we know that he says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except by him. So we know that there are many other religions and beliefs, but you cannot get to God without going through Jesus. So let's be really clear about that. You can believe in God, that's fine, but the only way to receive salvation, redemption from sin, is through Jesus Christ. And the way we make him our Lord and Savior 
is to confess with our mouths and to believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and the word of God says that you shall be saved. So we make that confession, uh, an audible confession that comes, that speaks from the heart. Um, and then baptism. We offer baptism because our Savior was baptized. And so it is an outward example of an inward cleansing, that we go down one way, that we come up another way. So um, we know that a lot of churches aren't open, and even if they are, it may be at a restricted compa capacity, that they are not um, offering baptism. And if they're not, that's fine, because it doesn't necessarily require a church pool. You can use any pool. You can use your tub. You can use a bucket of water. Um, what matters is the intent behind the act. So baptism. And then um, the last is just general prayer. Again, it's Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and we want to make sure that we're lifting up people above ourselves. Because most times, if you can pray, you're all right. Because when things are traumatic in your life, sometimes you don't even have a desire to pray. You just want to sit. So if you are able to pray, I encourage you that in your prayers, you pray for others. But we want to offer general prayer. Um, is that it? Do you have anything else? So I'll go ahead and pray. And we're agreeing with you, whether your situation is, I need salvation. I want Jesus to be Lord of my life, or I desire to be baptized, or the combination of those two, or I just need general prayer. In all those situations, we are standing and believing with you, knowing that the prayer offered in faith will raise up whatever situation. Bless God. Father, we just thank you for your opportunity or for the opportunity to hear your word today for we know that it is life and health unto us. We thank you, Father, for every single person who has joined service, whether in person or virtually. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to be by them, that you would minister to them, that this word falls on good ground in their heart, that it resonates with them, that they understand that they are able to get up from every situation, that, that, that this will be their testimony, that they got up, that regardless of what happened in their lives, that with your help, they got up. Your word says that I can do all things, not some, but all things who cry through Christ who gives me strength. So we thank you for strengthening us and lifting us above every single situation for encouraging us to press on. We thank you, Father. Now humble us before you, O oh God. In your love and not in your wrath, humble us before you. Now, Lord, we lift up every single person who desires to know you as Lord and Savior. We audibly confess with our mouths that you, that you, Father God, raised Jesus from the dead. And we adopt that belief in our hearts. And we ask that you would come in and rule and reign as Savior in our lives, as a Lord of our lives, as a Redeemer, oh God. For those that are seeking baptism, we ask, Lord, that you would anoint the water, that you would trouble the water, that they would go down as the old man and come up anew, oh God, that they would be on fire for you and about your business. We thank you, oh God, for every single person, yes. every household that is represented. And we ask that you would continue to be by them as they have made um, professions of their heart, oh God. Yes. That they would stand by the things that you have given them today. And that they would be mighty in you. 
Now bless and keep us, O oh God. Keep your head of protection around us. Continue to strengthen us and uplift us and to call us by your spirit. We love and reverence your holy and righteous name. It's in the almighty name of Jesus we pray and ask it to be so. Bless God. Bless God. Bless God. So uh, there is nothing else. Again, we pray that you were blessed today. This word blessed me, but I want to encourage you. Get up. From whatever situation you have, get up.